Okay, so let's get started. Um, thanks very much, everybody. Welcome to the second ECR ICMRBS uh, webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about nucleic acids. Um, and we've got three great um, scientific talks um, and one non-scientific talk, which I hope you all stay for. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to have some time for um, chatting to the speakers. So I hope you will stay for that too. Um, so just briefly, some housekeeping stuff. Um, if you'd like to speak, um, please email us. You can find details on our Twitter or our webpage. Um, if you'd like to join the mailing list, um, please email Kevin Gardner. Um, please don't record or share any of the talks today. Um, some people might be um, presenting unpublished work. Um, but we're going to upload any talks that we've got permission to um, to the YouTube channel. Um, and if you have any questions, please just type them in the Q&A box. Um, and if you want to read them out, um, raise your hand and uh, we'll get that sorted. Okay, so thanks very much. I'm going to pass over to Reed, who's going to introduce our first speaker. He grew up in India and he did his undergraduate studies at Indian Institute of Technology, where he worked on studying nucleic acid acids and proteins using molecular dynamic simulations. Then he went to pursue his doctoral studies at Duke, where he became interested in Hashimi's work on nucleic acid dynamics. His work in you know, studying sparsely populated conformations on nucleic acids using NMR and other biophysical techniques. Thank you, Atu, and welcome. Okay, uh, so uh, I think you, everyone should be able to uh, see my screen now. Uh, so first, I'd like to start out by uh, thanking the organizers for organizing the seminar and uh, giving me the opportunity to present my research. So I'm a sixth year graduate student in the uh, Al Hashimi lab at Duke. And today I'll be talking to you all about some work I've done regarding the uh, CES experiment. So uh, as we all know, uh, conformational changes in biomolecules are important in, in, uh, in a variety of biological processes. For example, uh, shown here is, uh, is an example of uh, a riboswitch wherein, um, so these riboswitch molecules change conformation um, uh, between different states in response to uh, metabolites and uh, in order to regulate the uh, expression uh, of downstream genes. Another process where uh, conformational changes in biomolecules are important is that of catalysis. Shown here is an example of a DNA polymerase. In, in particular, uh, highlighted here uh, in these squares uh, are these DNA base pairs. So it's been hypothesized that conformational changes of the mismatched GT uh, base pair between this wobble conformation and this Watson-Crick-like conformation is actually responsible uh, or involved in the process uh, uh, it, uh, in which the polymerase makes errors, leading to uh, uh, mutations in the DNA. Another pr uh, process where uh, conformational changes is important is that of molecular folding. Um, uh, uh, during the process of folding, uh, molecules can populate intermediate states that have distinct functions. Shown here is an example from uh, Lewis K's group where uh, uh, using NMR experiments, they were able to show uh, that a sparsely populated intermediate is formed during the process of folding, which uh, was also shown to be uh, aggregation prone. And uh, lastly, another process where conformational changes are important is that of uh, drug targeting. So it's been proposed that uh, these alternative conformational uh, states can have unique drug pockets and can be targeted. And this is an uh, ongoing area of research. So in order to deeply understand these processes and to manipulate them for our advantage, we need to be able to understand the, uh, or characterize the conformational changes of, the, uh, of these molecules. And uh, in general, these conformational changes uh, happen across a variety of time scales and length scales. So for example, on the Pico to nanosecond time scale, uh, shown here is an example of, uh, of uh, a nucleic acid. You can uh, think of it uh, as a DNA molecule. And on the Pico to nanosecond time scale, uh, DNA undergoes bond vibration motions. And on the, uh, let's say the nano to millisecond time scale, DNA undergoes global and local changes in structure uh, as indicated here, which are also coupled to uh, changes in the base pairs as shown here in red. And on the very slow taken seconds time scale, uh, nucleic acids also undergo the process of melting wherein they dissociate into the single strands. So uh, for the purposes of this talk, the, uh, the time scale of the dynamics I'll be focusing on is the uh, micro to millisecond time scale. The reason being that this time scale is the one that's uh, relevant for many biological processes, in particular, the ones that I've spoken about in the previous slide. So we need techniques to uh, monitor these uh, dynamic processes and the technique uh, of choice is NMR because uh, it's one of the uh, uh, only techniques that can give uh, atom result uh, information on the dynamics. And in particular, these measurements rely, uh, these NMR measurements rely on a phenomenon called chemical exchange. 
So I'll give a very brief intro about this. Um, so you can uh, consider this molecule on the left shown here, and uh, let's say you're monitoring the environment of this yellow atom. Uh, we would all, uh, if this molecule just adopts this conformation here, you would just see one peak in your NMR spectrum. Uh, now, if, uh, if you consider this molecule adopting two conformations, and this uh, yellow atom is close by to the side of the conformation change, it's definitely going to have two chemical shifts. And uh, if these conformations do not interconvert, the uh, sizes of these peaks will be proportional to the populations of these conformations. And now if you have interconversion between these conformations uh, due, uh, as a result of this exchange, what, uh, what happens to the spectrum is that the uh, peaks get widened and typically the minor peak becomes invisible and the details of the exchange get encoded in, uh, in the broadening of the major peak. Um, and it turns out that uh, one can do NMR experiments in which uh, one applies radio frequency fields that are indicated by this black lightning and then vary the frequency of this radio frequency uh, field. And uh, you can also vary the strength of the radio frequency field and repeat this process. And as Hab was mentioned, uh, this, uh, the, uh, this information can be fit out to give you uh, key parameters regarding this exchange process. In particular, the, uh, the population of this sparsely populated conformer, uh, the exchange rate, uh, which is the sum of the backward and forward rate constants, and the delta omega, the chemical shift difference between the sparsely populated state and the, uh, and the majorly populated state. So it turns out that uh, there are uh, a variety of NMR experiments for doing this, and they, they come in different flavors. So uh, I, I'll give a brief intro of these to, to motivate the, uh, the, the subject of my studies. So uh, one of these techniques is called CPMG or car per, per cell my uh, spectroscopy, and it's, it's useful for monitoring dynamics in the millisecond time regime. Uh, in particular, the exchange rate is, is on the order of a few thousands per second. Um, and the uh, another important point is that uh, this experiment can um, can be done on all the nuclei in your molecule at once, um, and you you would get information about chemical exchange at all of these sites from doing uh, this uh, this one experiment. Um, and then the the second uh, uh, flavor of the NMR experiment is called CEST or chemical ex exchange saturation transfer, and uh, it's also suitable for characterizing slightly slower uh, exchange processes with exchange rates in the order of few hundreds per second. And uh, again, in, an, in a manner analogous to CPMG, this experiment can be done on all uh, nuclei in your molecule at once, giving information about chemical exchange processes at all of these nuclei. Um, the last uh, flavor of the experiment that I'll talk about is, is uh, R1 row, a relaxation uh, in the rotating frame, which was introduced by Hampus earlier. And uh, this in this experiment, the advantage is that you can probe a wide uh, range of exchange processes with uh, with a, a large variation in exchange rates from the order of a few thousand to many thousands per second. Uh, the disadvantage though is that uh, due to the uh, nature of the experiment, uh, this requires um, uh, us to uh, interrogate only one nucleus at a time. So uh, although this uh, the Avondra experiment can give you uh, information about a wide uh, range of exchange processes, it has to be done separately on each nuclei in your molecule, in, in your molecule uh, one after the other. Uh, so in, in, in the sense that it's, it's more time consuming. So the bottom line here is just that there is no one single NMR experiment which can uh, interrogate um, uh, biomolecular dynamics across a variety of time scales in a time efficient manner. And this is the question that uh, we thought we could, uh, we, we wanted to address and uh, try to get at. Um, so moving forward uh, to, uh, to kind of explore our strategy, uh, I'll move forward with the SEST and Aundra experiments and uh, I won't be talking about the C CPMG experiments and in general, uh, CPMG has not uh, been as widely used as, uh, let's say, Cest and Avondra, uh, because of reasons that has, have to do with the uh, have to do with the, uh, dealing about uh, homonuclear couplings when using uniformly labeled samples. So moving forward, I'll talk about Cest and Avondra. So to uh, motivate this method and to explain how it works, I'll give a brief intro of what these experiments actually mean. So in the Cest experiment, you have your uh, magnetization of your nucleus along the z-axis. You apply a radio frequency field. Uh, uh, which is usually weak in nature, and then you, you change the frequency at which you apply this field. Uh, and then, um, in, whereas in the Avondra experiment, you, you monitor the, uh, the magnetization along uh, something called an effective field when, uh, I'm sorry, uh, when you apply a, a spin lock uh, and you, when you vary the frequency. And uh, in the Avondra experiment, you monitor the relaxation of your magnetization along this effective field. And uh, in the CES experiment, you, you monitor the uh, amount of magnetization you have along C. So to motivate the method, uh, uh, I like to introduce this well-known uh, um, equivalence in the literature wherein uh, it's known that CES is equivalent to Avondra when the spin lock field is weak. So I'll uh, proceed to explaining that. Uh, so in the Avondra experiment, you, you align your magnetization along a particular direction. 
which is specified by the spin lock power omega one uh, and the offset or the uh, frequency at which you uh, apply your field. Um, so uh, just by looking at this diagram, you can see that as you decrease the, the, uh, the strength of the spin lock field, your effective field is slowly gonna go towards the x-axis. And this is exactly analogous to the CEST experiment wherein the effect, wherein the magnetization is, is uh, along the uh, z-axis. So uh, th this equivalence is well known in the literature that the CEST experiment is the uh, uh, Avondra experiment as the, uh, your spin lock power tends to uh, become very small. So we, we sort of wanted to ask the inverse question wherein uh, could, if we do the opposite, if we increase the spin lock power in CEST, could that be used to characterize uh, uh, faster exchange processes? And this is the question that uh, kind of uh, popped up in our heads and we wanted to test it. Uh, so before going, uh, answering this question, I'd like to give you a sense of the data so that, uh, which, so that it will be useful later. Um, so in the CES experiment, you measure something called a CES profile. And uh, again, in the experiment, you, you, you take your magnetization, uh, which, which is along the Z direction, you apply an RF field along uh, the transverse plane at different frequencies and let's say different strengths. And then you apply it for a given time and then you monitor the amount of magnetization along Z that you have left. So as you can imagine, if you have magnetization along Z, Z it's gonna undergo R1 relaxation. So that's why the, uh, your CES profile is typically, uh, it, it, the baseline is, is a number lesser than one. And then as the frequency of the field matches that of, the, uh, of your peak, uh, your magnetization is gonna be dephased and that's why you get a dip in the CES profile. So this is in the absence of exchange. So when you do have exchange uh, and you repeat the exact same process, if you perform a CES experiment, what you would see is uh, in addition to the major state dip uh, corresponding to the, the, the observed peak in your NMR spectrum, you would also see another dip uh, at the position uh, of your minor state. Um, and this happens because uh, the uh, the uh, ground state and excited state magnetizations are in exchange with each other and uh, when you place the uh, your uh, RF field at the excited state position, th there is dephasing. So uh, the the bottom line here is just that if you see two dips in your CES profile, you you have a a, a minor species. If you just see one major dip, you, you do not have a minor species in solution. Uh, so moving on to the Avondra experiment. Um, so in this experiment, you take your magnetization, you 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 place it along something called the effective field, and you apply uh, the uh, the effective field is specified by the uh, radio frequency field that you apply and you change the, uh, the strength and the uh, frequency of the uh, applied radio frequency field. And then you monitor the relaxation of your magnetization along this effective field. So this rate of relaxation is, is called Avondra and here you can plot it as a function of the frequency at which you apply a field. And then you can do it for uh, varying strengths of the spin lock field that you apply. So in the absence of exchange, the, uh, the Avondra profile is expected to be completely symmetric. Um, and then, uh, however, just by looking at this, it's hard to uh, tell whether there is exchange or not. So uh, th through some details I won't get into here, you can convert this R1 row number into another number that's exactly reflective of the amount of exchange that you have. Uh, and uh, this quantity called R2 plus RDX will, uh, be flat, uh, will, will not vary with the offset when you have no exchange in your sample. However, when you do have exchange uh, and then you repeat the exact same R1 row procedure, what you would have is an asymmetric R1 row profile. You can see here that there's a bump in the R1 row profile. And then when you convert it into the, into the R2 plus, plus REX quantity that's reflective of exchange, you, you see a bump in the profile. So the, uh, the bottom line here is that if you see a mountain in your profile, you have confirmation exchange. Um, so moving on to our question, can, can we use high powers in CEST? And uh, can that uh, help us uh, characterize uh, faster exchange processes? So to do that, we first started out with uh, doing simulations to, uh, to see if this is in any way possible. So as a control, um, we first did R1 row simulations for a variety of exchange rates. Um, typically exchange around uh, the order of uh, a few hundreds per second is the regime that's characterized using CES. But R1 row, as I had mentioned earlier, can characterize a wide range of exchange rates. And you see that the, all the R1 row profiles have mountains. So suggesting that confirmation exchange can be monitored by R1 row across all of these three exchange rates. So now moving on, if you repeat this process and do the CES simulations, you can again do them for these exchange rates. And um, so as a control, typically for the slow exchange rates that CEST is typically used for, the CEST profiles do display a bump. So that's great, the, everything's working as expected. And uh, the other thing that we also notice is that this bump becomes wider and wider as your exchange rate becomes higher. And conventionally, this is the reason why people don't use CEST to uh, measure fast exchange rates because the CEST profiles become very broad and insensitive to the exchange, as you can see here. So uh, especially for a fast process, about uh, many thousands per second, 
the uh, the profile in the absence of exchange uh, denoted using these dotted lines is very similar to the uh, profile in the presence of exchange, which is denoted using these solid lines. So this is at low spin lock powers. Now, if we move to high spin lock powers, when we do have slow exchange, again, things are working as expected. It's known that when you use high spin lock powers, the test peaks get broadened. And this is, uh, again, another reason why people have not conventionally used it, because the uh, the, the, uh, the thought was that this would make determination of the chemical shift of the uh, transient state harder because now you have a, a shoulder instead of a clean peak. Uh, but interestingly, what we also see is that this shoulder persists when the exchange rate is increased. And even when the uh, lower spin lock powers are insensitive to the exchange, the high spin lock powers do seem to be insensitive to the exchange in the sense that uh, the, the shoulders do still persist. Uh, so this suggests that the uh, using high spin lock powers could enable characterization of faster processes, and we wanted to test this out. This is just simulations, but we need a model system to do this. So to do that, we uh, we took this DNA hairpin containing a GT mismatch, and uh, it's been shown uh, uh, previous studies in the lab which have shown that GT mismatches undergo a confirmation exchange between this wobble confirmation on the left and this Watson critic like confirmation on the right. And this exchange process is typically quite fast on the order of a few thousands per second. So, we, so th since this has already uh, been studied, we thought that we could use this as a model system to benchmark this approach. So first, um, uh, we, we wanted to uh, see whether uh, the, the approach works. So to do that, we, we focused on a negative control. In particular, we focused on the uh, C1 prime atom of, uh, of this timing here. So the R1 row profile, uh, again, the previous studies have shown that uh, these R1 row profiles do not sense this uh, exchange process between the wobble and the Watson crick like confirmation. And as expected, uh, the, the R1 row profile doesn't have a mountain and the low power CS profiles just have one dip or, 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 or one peak. Uh, again, this is as expected. So now if you move on to the high, CES profile, high power CS profile, what we should expect here is that the profile shouldn't have any shoulders. It is cement, It should be symmetric. That is the expectation. But uh, it's diff kind of difficult to see that uh, if I just show you this profile. So to make it easier, what uh, we can do is plot the, uh, the intensity in the CES profile, a uh, correlation plot of the intensity for both positive and negative offsets. And we see that uh, if the profile is, is symmetric, it should, uh, both of these intensities should be equal. And that's exactly what we see. All of the intensities lie on the y equals x line. And the difference in these intensities is very small and is centered around zero. So this is great. So when there is no exchange, the experiment does seem to work. So now we need uh, to actually show the experiment is working. Uh, we need to uh, uh, check whether it can actually monitor the exchange. So to do that, we, we focus on these two sites highlighted uh, in red. So one of them is a nitrogen atom, one of them is carbon. Um, so first, we did our experiments. These profiles have mountains that can be fitted to yield fast, uh, a relatively fast exchange process of around 3,000 per second, which is uh, considered to be outside the typical detection limit of the SES experiment. So considering that this process is fast uh, on the order of a few thousands per second, low power SES profiles should not be able to, de to detect it. And this is what we see. So uh, the data is shown in, uh, in circles here and the uh, dashed lines are profiles in the absence of exchange. So we see that there are very, uh, the deviations from the profiles in the absence of exchange are very minor. And this is again, as expected, the, uh, the exchange process falls outside the limit of the uh, conventional low power CES uh, experiment. So then uh, moving on to a high power CES approach, here uh, the, uh, the data is shown in circles, the solid lines is a fit to the data, and the dashed lines denote profiles in the absence of exchange. So we see that uh, as uh, suggested by our simulations, the, the profiles, in the, uh, the high power CES profiles do display shoulders uh, uh, in both the nitrogen data and the carbon data. And uh, we were able to fit this uh, to extract the exchange parameters. And shown here is a comparison of the exchange parameters, in particular, the, uh, the population, the, the exchange rate or the kinetics and the delta omega values for both these nuclei. And we see a reasonable agreement between the R1 row determined numbers and the CES uh, determined numbers using high powers. So this suggests that the approach uh, can uh, does work. And with that, I'd like to move on to the conclusions. The conclusions is, uh, one of the main conclusions is that uh, when you when we do do test ex experiments uh, in the conventional mode when using low spin lock powers, if we just see one single dip, that doesn't imply that there's no dynamics in our system. It could be that if you if, if you simply increase your spin lock power, uh, you, you might be able to see new forms of dynamics. And this can give you information about what's happening uh, with, with the system. And the nice thing about this is that um, this test experiment can be run on all the nuclei in your molecule at once. So you can uh, measure these faster time, uh, time scale exchange, uh, exchange processes 
simultaneously on all the nuclei in your molecule in a single shot using this SS experiment. And this is, uh, th this is an advantage relative to the R1 row wherein you have to do a separate experiment for each nucleus. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, many people, my, the lab, uh, Hashim, uh, for, for being great and for supporting me, and uh, the people highlighted in bold who've trained me, my thesis committee, uh, the Duke Enema Center, and the NIH for funding. And with that, I'd uh, love to take questions. Thank you, Atul. Really nice talk. We have time for questions. Maybe I can ask one while, while people are thinking. And uh, thank you, Atul, for a very nice presentation. Just wondering from your simulations, you, you demonstrate nicely on, on your model system here for KX about 3,000 per second. But from your simulations, do you have a rough feeling for maybe what is the upper limit of KX values that you can measure with high power test? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, that's a very uh, good question. Um, and maybe I should follow up and say the upper limit where you can extract KX and and delta omega values. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, what we uh, see from let's say these simulations is that as you increase the KX, the uh, the solid lines denote the profiles uh, in the presence of exchange. Uh, what you see is that uh, these uh, the profiles in the presence of exchange uh, become more and more symmetric, and the the shoulder. Uh, uh, so when, when we fit these profiles, we rely on the fact that there is a shoulder or asymmetry in the SES profile. So that asymmetry kind of diminishes as the exchange rate increases. Um, as you can see for this uh, orange curve here uh, at 9,000 versus 3,000. So from these simulations, it suggests that around uh, 10,000 or maybe uh, a bit higher would be the limit, uh, wherein you would be able to uh, reliably extract exchange parameters. The other issue uh, is that you can't go too high in spin-lock powers too. So uh, because uh, again, between 250 and 500, the, the, the thing that you measure, it keeps decreasing. The, the intensity that you measure is a small number. So it's difficult to measure that accurately. So I would say about um, 10 or 12,000 ish would be the uh, would be the number where you would be able to reliably extract uh, information. Uh, although we need a model system uh, with kinetics in that regime to actually test it out, but the simulation suggests that it would be around 10,000. Thank you, thank you. We have um, Romeo is asking, uh, where to talk, would you expect high power SES to be applic applic applicable to 1H SES as well? Or perhaps for a system with low proton density or would nosy artifacts be too strong? Yeah, th that is a great point. Um... Yeah, I mean, I don't see any reason why you cannot apply uh, high powers to uh, any SES experiment, including protons. Uh, but we, we haven't done uh, simulations with regards to proton SES to, to probe it. Um, one issue though with proton SES is that uh, in general, the uh, population and kinetics uh, are not considered to be very reliable from proton SES alone. But I would assume that if, if proton SES at high powers is supplemented with other forms of uh, relaxation data, uh, like high power, let's say carbon or nitrogen SES, uh, you would be able to reliably extract exchange parameters. Um, one more. Uh, how does high power SES compare to CPMG relaxation dispersion experiment? Any advantages? Yeah, yeah, so that's a very good point. So CPMG, uh, uh, Lewis has shown that CPMG can go up to uh, six, six to 8,000 per second uh, if supplemented with the uh, exchange induced chemical shifts. The uh, big advantage of SES for nucleic acids is that uh, it's able to deal with carbon-carbon uh, and carbon-nitrogen uh, couplings that arise when you have uniformly labeled samples. Uh, so that is one big advantage. Whereas uh, CPMG applications to nucleic acids are typically limited because they require the production of uh, atom-specifically labeled uh, carbon-13 or nitrogen samples, which lack the CC or NC couplings. And th this is uh, not widely commercially available. Only very few labs uh, are able to do this. So that is one big advantage of CEST relative to, uh, to, to CPMG. All right. Thank you. I think we can go to the last session. Thank you, Atul. Uh, I, really nice start. Thank you. I think we can move on. Uh, the next speaker is going to be talking about uh, her career. It's going to be Angela Gronenberg from Pittsburgh. And please go ahead. OK, let's see whether this works.
and everybody can relax now because this is the I hope you can see my screen. I don't know whether you can. Can somebody see the screen? We, we can we see can the see screen, the but screen. it's not in the full view yet. Yeah. Now it's the full view? OK. Yes. yes. Now yes. It's full view. So everybody can relax. And so you can relax. I'll play a little bit of music for you. And I'm not sure whether you can hear this. So, First, let me thank Angelo. And as you can see, I'm Angelo on the screen now. And the young investigators for inviting me to give this talk. It was actually quite an interesting exercise because I had to go back and unearth information that I had not looked at in a very long time. In contrast to today, where everybody walks around, with a phone and you can take pictures of whatever you do all the time, it would have been unheard of for us to walk around with a camera and take pictures in a lab. So what I will do, so in the la next 20, probably 30 minutes, and you can stop me anytime, is give you a time-lapse view of my scientific life with a little bit of science put in. So I started out with baby steps as everybody does. I studied chemistry and physics at the University of Cologne and I received my, in Germany it's called a diploma, it's equivalent to a master's degree in 1975. And for those of you who can read German, they will realize that I was actually a female, uh, a female who got a diploma as a Mr. Gronenborn. So they quickly crossed out the Mr. here, but they forgot that re there really is a pronoun in the letter of the sentence. So I still got my diploma as a male. So going on, I decided to do a PhD and my PhD advisor was Harold Ginter. He was one of the founding fathers of what, what is called the subgroup of NMR spectroscopy in the German Chemical Society. This is the building I studied in. It is no longer existed. It was on fire at some stage while I was a chemistry student, but it was very famous because um, basically one of the most famous German chemists, Alder, of the Diels Alder reaction worked in there. I was working in this building over here, which was called the Round Building. And it's a part of the fortifying walls that was built around Cologne by the Prussians. And that was the spectrometer was standing in this building. It was a variant HA100. And unfortunately, behind the building were train tracks. So we had to time our, our spectra. And when we recorded spectra very carefully, because every time a train went by on this oscilloscope, you would see a signal. So you we would know exactly when the in, in that case, freight trains would go past and we would know the window when we could uh, collect our data. This building actually was built in 1841 and it looked like that all through my career. However, now it's been nicely renovated and it was given to the university and there are other institutes in this building by now. Now, as you can imagine, chemistry was a very traditional discipline in Germany. I told you, Kurt Alder was there, who got the Nobel Prize in 1950. And he died fairly young in his mid, just late 50s. And then they decided that not a single person could replace him. So the institute was divided in two, organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, Emmanuel Vogel and Franz Verheer. Let me see if I can switch to the laser pointer, which is nicer. It was extended in 70 by two physical chemists and also another organic chemist. 
1973 with a theoretical chemist. So it was an, an institute of five to six professors. In 78, we moved from the building you saw on the previous slide into this very, very modern, nice building. And these are the only two pictures I found of us working in the building, traditional chemistry. Now, while I was in this very traditional chemistry building, there was a new institute being created in Cologne which was a very inspirational place as I tried to convey to you in a minute. It was founded by Max Delbruck and uh, a botanist. And they, what they tried to do is lure Max Delbruck back to Germany who'd immigrated to the US in 39. He was a physicist and he is really the father of phage genetics in the world. So there is a book written about the early chapter of German molecular biology. And I was looking at this book and I found this quote in there by Georg Michaelis, and it could have been from me because it was an amazing institute where lots of things were happening. And I'm again, I have two pictures here from my time at the institute where there was a a reading room at the top where there was a huge model of DNA and there were parties there, seminars and so on. So there was a real enthusiasm for science going on this, this institute. And I got, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the background. As I said, it was founded by Josef Straub and Max Delbruck, but he then returned back to Caltech, but he remained all his life a director on leave. And his vision was to remove this one headed entity that existed in Germany everywhere, where there was one professor with lots of slaves, and he wanted to have a team institute. So he hired a handful of young people and say, okay, get on with your science. But he left in 63 and it was almost the demise of that institute because the only one of the original pe people left was Peter Stalinger and by hook or by crook he got a professorship if you want, want to know I can tell you in the end how he did it and that basically saved the institute and then a number of other young professors were hired you can see they were all in their 30s and in addition, there were a couple of young group leaders that were also there. And a lot of exciting and very unconventional research went on there. And the reason I knew about this institute is because of this character. This is Bruno Gronenborn, my brother. He was the, a biology student. I was in the other institute. And while I was then working on my PhD during the day, I decided I'm going to work in this institute at night, which I did because that institute was working 24 seven. And in Klaus Rajewski's work, who was a professor at the time there, it was really considered not a mainstream science institute in Germany. It was supposedly really left wing and full of a lot of foreigners. So Bruno was working there and I put this paper of his up here for a particular reason, because I couldn't be more proud of this paper. I'm not an author on this paper, but I get an acknowledgement in a figure legend. I was a chemist and my brother tried to make cloning vehicles, something that you guys, you know about, but at the time nobody knew how to clone. So they, they were using M13 phage and he needed to mutagenize the phage to try to get restriction enzyme sequences in there. So I could synthesize not everything under the sun, but I could easily synthesize methyl nitrosyurea 
and I made a bucket of that. Bruno used it to mutagenize his phage, and this is the first time my name appears in print in the nature, in the, in the journal Nature. And as I said, I'm more proud of this paper than a lot of other papers that I've written over the years. So as I said, I worked there during the night, but we didn't only work hard, we also had fun together. As you can see, we used to sit around a table discussing, you can learn something about recombination here, discussing science, but then we all also went out to on, on trips and on parties. And every night when I went to the Institute, we all went out for dinner at a local pub and then went back to work. So, and then I had my night shift over there. In 1978, I've finally received my PhD. And by that time I've become female. I'm now no longer a male chemist, but a female chemist. And I, um, Harald Günther went to U University of Siegen and I went to the MRC Institute in Mill Hill. And here you can see the character you saw on the picture before. This is my brother. The PhD in Germany was you had to take an exam. And after the final exam, they said yes or no. And there I'm having a bo tiny bottle of champagne, sharing it with my brother. And to this day, we actually share a taste in science and a taste in wine. And you'll see later on why he developed a taste in wine a lot. So this is the Institute in Mill Hill called the National Institute for Medical Research. There were two institutes by the Medical Research Council in the UK, LMB and NIMR. And it, as you can see, it had a very interesting shape and it was a very famous institute. The first director was uh, Peter Medawa, an immunologist who got the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 60. And the next director was Arnold Bergen. And I wanted to look as a postdoc at protein DNA complexes by NMR, obviously influenced by my stay at night at the Institute for Molecular Biology in Cologne, because where I had been involved in all of this exciting work. Oh, as an aside, uh, my job there at night, I was actually paid for my job and I was uh, supposed to try to use DNAs one for sequencing. Just to put it in context, DNA sequencing hadn't been invented at that time. So I failed, but so obviously other people uh, succeeded. So I wrote this uh, several fellowship applications and this is that I duck them out again. So there were no computers, right? You would hide, had to type things on the, uh, on the typewriter, then you would have a copy paper in between and had a, 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 one of these very thin papers at the back because you wanted to keep a copy of what you send off. And I'm just reading you two sentences. Maybe if you can look, you can read yourself. I, I only show the application I wrote in English, one of them. The long-term aim of this proposed research is to investigate the use of NMR spectroscopy for studying at the atomic level protein DNA, DNA interactions that are important in biological control processes and so on. And then lower on it says that obviously this system is very complex and one has to start out with looking at a, a system where already something can be looked at. And that's why I'm applying to go to Jim Feeney's laboratory where they're already looking at binding of substrates, inhibitors and coenzymes to the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. This was way before this was possible. This was 1977, 2D NMR hadn't been invented yet. So probably correctly, some of the people around me when I got my PhD thought I was 
positively insane because I wanted to do something that one couldn't do. However, I seem to have been very lucky because I got the fellowships I applied for and just took that one that gave me the most money. So I moved to Mill Hill and this was the division where Jim Feeney was working in. You guys probably don't know Emsley Feeney Sutcliffe. This was a Bible for all of the organic chemists uh, and physical chemists at the time in NMR spectroscopy. Here you see Arnold Bergen, who was the head of the division and also the director of the Institute. Cyril was a technician in the lab and Arnold is actually posing at the spectrometer and Jim was really the person I wanted to work with. The division was called Molecular Pharmacology. This was our logo. We all had t-shirts with our moles on. And here you see, I think this picture was taken in 1980, all of our divisions standing in front of the Institute because we had quintennial reviews every five years. And for that review, there was always a picture taken. Because I came originally from small molecule NMR, and I loved to shim a spectrometer by hand with all of the different shim buttons. When I started to work in Mill Hill, I shimmed the instrument really well. And that came as a big, big advantage because what I could see that in a particular complex of dihydrofolate reductase with the coenzyme NADPH or NADP, I saw that histidine resonances were split into two. This told us that this complex existed in two different conformations in solution. And that earned me my first real nature paper. So, Purifying the enzyme from lactobacillus was a major enterprise. We would run 400 liter fermentations. There was a big hall set up where you would grow the bacterium. And then all of the downstream processes were factory style processes, the centrifugation, whatever you had to take out. Now, I had spent time in a this famous molecular biology institute and I thought this is insane I need to clone this enzyme so indeed I teamed up with one of the young group leaders that who was in Cologne at the time had moved on to Manchester Wayne Davis and decided to clone this particular protein and we did it was inserted into PBR322, which was the vector at the time where you would insect, inject uh, in, uh, put a, a, a gene in. And this clone for at least decades after I left Mill Hill was used there to produce the enzyme dihydrofolic reductase. We also sequenced the gene and this was the first real paper where I have a publication together with my brother. Now, this was also the time when I started to work with Marius Claw. I went to the ICMR BS meeting 1980 that was held on a little island Bendor off the coast of Marseille in the Mediterranean. When I came back from this meeting, a second desk was in my office. That office was six by six feet. So you can imagine that it was very, very cramped. By that time, I was also on the staff in Mill Hill because Arnold Bergen, after my fellowship ended and I wanted to move on, basically told me, here, you can have a student, you can have a technician, 
here's your job, work on whatever you want to work on. So he obviously had hired Marius and Marius decided to, although he initially wanted to work on fast reaction kinetics, Marius decided he would also work on NMR. And this was really a very long and fruitful collaboration with him. At that time, we had received the, a superconducting magnet, and that was the highest, one of the highest field spectrometers in the uh, UK. There was a 300 at Oxford, and we had a 270. And we worked out the transferred NOE. So basically, this allowed us to look at conformations of small molecules, whether they were drugs or other kinds of ligands bound to proteins. And it, was, it, it has been and still is a very successful methodology. Now, at that time, there was a strict division of methodologies and techniques and instrumentation at the MRC. In Cambridge was crystallography, in Mill Hill was NMR. So as you may know, Max Perutz was a very famous crystallographer who got the Nobel Prize with Kendrew for determining protein structures by crystallography. He approached us and asked whether it was possible to use this strange NMR technique to help him answer the question whether why GTP was a better allosteric effector for fish hemoglobins than ATP. So he came down, we discussed the experiments, and this resulted in the publication where we looked at the GTP bound to the fish hemoglobins. There were lots and lots of applications of the TRNOE methodology to other systems as well. Now, I still desperately wanted to use NMR to look at protein nucleic acid complexes. And we've, I've picked the cyclic AM, CRP, the cyclic AMP receptor protein initially for that. It was also interesting, it was called CRP in Europe and CAP in the US, but it's the same protein. It's, it's part of uh, the operator in, in, in front of LAC, and it all came again from the Institute for Genetics in Cologne. And I had to look, search the web because I could make nucleic acid pieces by cloning into PBR, growing E. coli with lots of vector DNA in, then making that DNA cesium chloride gradients, and then cutting it with a restriction enzyme. But you could only get 100 to 200 base pair pieces. And you couldn't do really high resolution NMR on it, especially not at 270 megahertz. So at that time, Marv Carruthers had just invented um, solid phase synthesis of nucleic acids. And there was this announcement of a course in Europe, the first course they ever gave on this methodology. And it was in Germany. So I decided to apply to this course. And this is what I found on the web about this. I clearly was one of a select group of 15 students because they accepted me. I, I learned how to make DNA on solid support. This is how it was done. There was this vessel here, the glass fret at the bottom. You would put your um, a glass bound first nucleotide on there, and then you would add the next nucleotide. You'd put lots of things, and you, you would actually shake by hand this vessel between each of the couplings. And in the end, you ended up with a small bit of oligonucleotide. So this, this was important. I took that technology back to Mill Hill. And these are pictures out of the first NOE-based structures of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And that was in the early 80s. And for those of you who are interested, there was we wrote a progress in NMR 
article about this in 1958. In 1984, we moved to the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Martinsree, just outside of Munich. They were very generous to us because they gave us a 500 megahertz instrument, lots of support. In London, we had one 500 megahertz instrument that we shared with the entire city of London. Anybody could apply and go there and Correct, collect data. So we were very well supported. And we continued our collaboration with Max Perot, who actually came to visit there. And we worked on some of his human hemoglobin studies, looking at, still at histidine resonances. And he stayed in the guest house there. And we literally worked side by side to end up with two, these two papers. The Max Planck was also the birthplace of molecular dynamics simulations for determining structures of biological molecules. And unfortunately, as I said, I wish I would have had pictures of Axel and Mika. Now it's called Michael Nilgis, but he's really called Michael Nilgis uh, in Martin Street. I took them now. Axel was a postdoc in Dieter Oesterhel's lab at the time, and Michael was a graduate student. And this fortunate constellation led to the development of molecular dynamics simulated annealing because Axel has just come back from Martin Karpels's lab where he was involved in developing CHARM. He then had the Cray version of CHARM, which was renamed CNS. And by now you all know that it merged uh, merged into the program that's now used a lot for structure determined called NIH Explore. So we did a lot of methodology development there and also the first protein structure was uh, solved by us in published in 86 and that was alpha-1 purocyanine. It was also the birthplace of a three-dimensional experiment. This is actually the first 3D experiment ever done. And it came about because Hartmut Oshkinat was a postdoc in our lab. And he and Christian Griesinger were fellow students together previously in Horst Kessler's lab. And so this combination with Christian at the time being in Richard's Ernst lab then led us to basically develop the first 3D experiment, which was basically a nosy ho ha ha experiment. This was followed very soon by the first protein structure that was deposited in the PDB. And you can look at the PDB and look what the first protein structure was. This is BDS that was solved by us and deposited in 89. In 1988, we moved to the NIH, and this really uh, was the start of two decades of amazingly exciting and interesting biological development. It was in the lab that Bill Eaton was the lab chief, and there was Ed Bax, Dennis Top. Dennis Torsha was in the Dental Institute, but used the spectrometers over in building two and then five. Attila Sabo did a lot of theoretical work. And all of those amazing colleagues there allowed us to not only develop a lot of biological experiments, but also work on systems that were very interesting interleukins, other chemokines and cytokines, protein nucleic acid complexes, protein protein complexes. And this is really the outcome of a large group of extremely talented and hardworking postdocs uh, in the Bax-Claw-Gronenborn groups. And this is 
the only pi picture I have of me sitting at my architect's drafting table doing assignments by hand on paper. This is how it was done at the time. Obviously, you all know the enormous power that 3 and 4D heteronuclear NMR brought to the NMR field. And a lot of those experiments were again developed on a protein that was very large at the time, 157 amino acids into leukine one beta. And this to this day is still my all time favorite slide. Uh, we put this in a review we wrote in Science in 1991. Here is a 2D proton proton spectrum of interleukin 1 beta. And I've positioned this red star here at a particular proton proton intersection 1.39 and 1.67 ppm. Now, if you look at your 4D experiment, or take the 3D experiment and pull out a slice out of it. At that particular intersection, 1.39 and 1.67 ppm, if you look down the cube, you actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven peaks superimposed. So there would have been no chance to ever see an individual peak, never mind that they're actually seven peaks superimposed. So 3 and 4D NMR really revolutionized how we do biological NMR now. But I hadn't forgotten that I still loved to work with my brother. And we continued this throughout our career. This is a structure of a domain of a protein that came from one of his viruses. He had moved on. He basically worked on plant viruses uh, in an institute just outside Paris. He moved around the world and science as well. And this was the tomato yellow, yellow leaf curl virus. So it's a replication initiation protein. It starts roll, rolling circle replication and solving the structure of that catalytic domain allowed us to propose a mechanism for this protein in the virus. And these viruses can be quite devastating, not only producing in a mild disease, these curled yellow leaves, they can actually totally devastate plants. And it is important that those viruses are studied because tomatoes in some parts of the world are a very important food group. In 2005 and six, I relocated to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh is known as the city of bridges. And I was very interested in building bridges between cellular and molecular structural approaches and all kinds of other uh, methodologies. Fortunately for me, the senior vice chancellor of the medical school uh, appreciated the value of structural biology and put a lot of support into building a unique structure. A new building went up. This is called BST3, where we are located. And in the first three floors of those are all of the methodologies represented in instrumentation for structural biology. We started, we have NMR, cryo-EM, crystallography, all kinds of other biophysical approaches. And in the basement of the building, we have a light infused, very large area where our magnets are um, located. And as I said, this is the, the, the support. It was really the support by the institution and the quest that was allowed me to build a brand new department of structural biology. 
I'm very committed to integrated approaches. Again, the city of bridges have wrapped up on me. And not only just the structural techniques, but all kinds of other spectroscopy, cell biology, biochemistry, and computation. Because really, if you want to understand a function, we have to integrate all of those approaches if we want to know in detail how a particular molecular entity works in the cell. So in Pittsburgh, we also have the Pittsburgh Center for HIV Protein Interactions, where this philosophy we've basically put into work where we look at proteins that are HIV encoded, interacting with cellular proteins, and we'll look at the, the um, interactions, make sure they occur in the cell, make sure they're biological significant, and then if possible, do structures by whatever means we can do. And in that sense, the structure of a native HIV capsid was the culmination of this philosophy using integrated approaches. We use the X-ray structure of the NTD, the NMR structure of the C-terminal dimer, which links together hexameric units, and cryo-EM density from an in vitro assembled capsid tube. In the end, in combination with cryo-ET from a native capsid and computation putting together this overall very, very large system and checking and verifying that all of the interactions we see by structural means really are also important in vivo by mutagenesis. So this paper in nature really is representative of the approach we take in our center. Now, in the, in the year 12, 2012 and 13, I went on my first sabbatical in my life, never been on a sabbatical. And I went to the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin, which is located in these beautiful old villas in um, the Grunewald, which is a suburb or a, a, um, a, 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 not a suburb, it's actually a region of Berlin. So in that institute, they have around 30 fellows, fellows who live there. And the only requirement for the fellows is that they have to live there, they have to meet for one meal a day, and they have to appear what was called the Tuesday weekly colloquium. So I picked a subject that I was very interested in, but knew not enough about. So my, the title of my uh, um, project was Redefining Multi and Interdisciplinary Approaches in Basic Science Using Structural Biology as the example. And I called this Integrative Multidisciplinarity. So I embarked on this study where I wanted to evaluate whether scientists who work in interdisciplinary teams are more successful than scientists who work in traditional disciplines. And there's lots of anecdotal evidence about this, but there had never been a systematic study. So I had access to public databases. And because I sat on the evaluation committee for long years of the Human Frontier Science Program, I also got all of their data. And I looked at that. And this was an experiment that I have to say I really failed in. I thought that if I know how to run experiments, interpret data in the natural sciences. If I would just have the right data, the right sentences, I could find important, or I could distill out important findings. But it turned out that this is really an experiment sort of more in social sciences and not in natural sciences. So 
when I gave my colloquium on the 7th of May, I realized this was the 7th of May, which 40, 54 years earlier, C.P. Snow delivered the Reed Lecture in Cambridge. And if you've never read the Reed Lecture, you should go and read it. It's about the two cultures, natural sciences and social sciences. If you have time, go and read it. It's still applicable today. And I finished my colloquium with the question whether the two cultures are still alive and well today, which is now almost 60 years after the Reed Lecture. So the only tangible result was that I interacted with lots of interesting people. For instance, I had to live at the Institute and we all got not only apartments, we got apartments, we got offices, and then there was a building where we would eat and socialize. Fortunately for me, my fellow fellow who had the apartment below me was Alfred Brendel. So if I would happen to be at home when he was practicing his piano, I got a free concert and it was pretty wonderful. In the villa where I had my office, I was in the basement, my office. The first floor was a beautiful studio where a painter was located, Kamal. And as you can see, the painting that's behind me right now is one of his paintings. I went up to his studio frequently and we talked about his paintings and what I was doing. And from there on a very strong friendship developed and I still see him and talk to him every year. And one of those paintings I bought, which is shown on the slide and in the background behind me and hangs in my house now. I also learned a lot about lots of philosophy and the Ottoman Empire, because basically there were only very few scientists there. There was a physicist from the ETH and me, and the rest were writers, musicians, philosophers, and historians. The last few years I've become very interested in fluorine enema, and hopefully I don't have to remind you that fluorine is a very powerful nucleus for enema. It's basically not present in any biological material. It's 100% natural abundant, and it has a very, very wide chemical shift range. And we've done quite a bit of work looking at fluorinated proteins interacting with ligands, in particular for the HIV enzyme reverse transcriptase. And there is a methods in enzymology paper where there's some of this work is summarized by my then graduate student, Neymar Sharaf. And one of the very powerful experiments we have developed is using fluorine paramagnetic relaxation enhancement to look at interactions between either domains on proteins or two domains in multi-protein complexes because we can measure distances up to 30 angstroms with this approach. We also embarked on a very successful and enjoyable interaction with Tatiana Polonova's group at the University of Delaware, where we integrated solution fluorine enema with solid state fluorine enema. And in the solid state, you can on very large assemblies like the tube of the HIV capsid can measure distances by fluorine fluorine correlation experiments up to 20 angstrom. And this is her group and her students who have been really wonderful in getting all of this methodology in the solid state going. During the year Two th years 2016 and 18, I was an Einstein Fellow in Berlin, and that entails that you go three times a year for a few weeks and spend time in different institutions. And the most important group for me was Phil Selenko's group in Berlin, where I just became a postdoc and learned about 
in cell enema. And I'm now applying fluorine enema in mammalian cells to look at proteins because as you are well aware, there are lots of protons, there are lots of carbons, there are lots of nitrogens in a cell, but very little fluorine. So if I can put a fluorinated protein into the cell, as you can see here, the black spectrum is the in-cell spectrum and the red spectrum is the solution spectrum. We can follow those proteins in the cell and probe their interactions. And if you allow me to have three more slides, I will talk about something general about science and what it takes to be successful in science. And I know I've gone over time, but if, if somebody gives me the thumbs up, I'll put three more slides up. Please go ahead. Okay. So what do I believe what it takes to succeed in science? I use this slide when I talk to the graduate students in our recruiting for graduate student or the first seminar. There are three attributes and those are all essential. Ability is basically what you are capable of. But I tell students, you can't take credit for your ability because if you have been endowed with good genes, thank your parents for it. Motivation is what determines what you do. And people around you contribute to your motivation. Certainly for me, if I would have never gone to the Institute for Genetics and been in, embedded in these young molecular biologists at the time, I would not have done in my life what I did. So people contribute, but you have to be responsive to what's around you. So I give you half the credit for that. Where you get the full credit for is for attitude. This determines how well you do with both your motivation and your ability. And so your attitude is, is, is decisive in how well you really succeed in science. And you may have realized by now that I'm very partial to art. This is a painting that hangs in the Petit Palais in Paris. And because my brother was in Paris, I used to go there all the time. What I found interesting, this is a painting that was painted in 1881. And for the females in this group and the males, I want to point out who is represented as ciencia and who is presented as labor. The man is the laborer and the female is the scientist. Keep that in mind for those of you who are females. So what should you do? Pick a very important problem. Work hard, inspire and engage the people around you. Look at your goals and objectives, collaborate and network with your colleagues. And you, the early career scientist in ICMRBS, you've actually done this now. You've done an amazing job putting together this series and the seminars I've heard so far are absolutely spectacular and great. Keep doing this. Utilize your friends and your mentors, but the friends are more important and discuss what you're doing with them and interface with your mentors and it, keep them updated about what you do. This will stand you in good position to end up with a very nice job in your end. And coming back to Peter Medawar, who was the director because before Arnold Burton, he wrote a very charming and insightful book. Again, if you haven't read that book, anybody who goes through my lab gets a copy of that book. It's called Advice to a Young Scientist, and it's timeless. It's true today. He emphasizes the importance of common sense, diligence, a sense of purpose, to focus, ability to focus on a problem, 
concentrate, persevere, and not be frustrated by adversity. You by now know that 95% of all experiments fail. The only thing you can hope for is that you, they fail fast and you can move on. However, I also strongly believe that scientific research happens in an atmosphere of human diversity where people of different cultures and personalities are involved and we need to embrace empathy, tolerance and understanding because it is these attributes that help us to get along with other scientists, with people in general, with collaborators and also with administrators. And this is a card that stands on my desk. And I look at it every day and I totally and fervently believe in what it says on this card. We must absolutely what we love. Otherwise we'll run the risk of not doing anything at all. So if you love doing what you do now, you really will be good at it. And with this, I'm going to my last slide, which thanks all my former students, postdocs, former and present collaborators, and they have been plentiful. But right now, it's my current lab members in my group who make my work now possible and my life enjoyable. And with this, I'll thank you for listening.